My name is Dana Williams, and I have the pleasure of serving as the Dean of the Graduate School here at Howard University. Importantly, as is the tradition of many people who are thinking about land ownership, I uh, pause now to acknowledge that the land that the university sits on is actually the land um, of the Anacostan uh, peoples. Um, and we are grateful um, to be able to hopefully be good caretakers of the space, even as we acknowledge that it is land that was not ceded um, in fairness. I am also privileged um, to introduce to those of you who are unaware until this moment of the quantum biology laboratory, um, which is a part of the graduate school at Howard University and its director, Dr. Philip Kirian. Dr. Kirian is a theoretical physicist, a researching scientist, and essayist serving as the founding director of the Quantum Biology Laboratory. And I'm sure you will hear a little bit more about that. And if not, we will certainly drop the website in the chat for you to spend some time with the lab. The lab is at Howard University, um, and as I noted, a part of the graduate school. And we are always pleased uh, with the work that comes out of that space, both internal to the university, but outside as well. Beginning his career as a math teacher in North Philadelphia, Dr. Kirian is now the recipient of fellowships, grants, and awards from the United States, um, the Italy Fulbright Commission, Argonne and Oak Ridge Leadership Computing Facilities, the Whole Genome Science Foundation, the National Science Foundation, and the National Institutes of Health. His laboratory studies how collective and cooperative quantum behaviors can explain biological phenomena at the mesoscopic, organismal, and clinical scales, including neurodegeneration, cancer, and human consciousness. In 2020, the Quantum Biology Laboratory became the first group in the United States and the third in the world to receive a scientific grant from the United Kingdom-based Guy Foundation. And in 2021, Dr. Kirian was appointed as the lead expert for the National Academy's workshop on quantum biology. In 2022, he will be a senior fellow at the UCLA Institute for Pure and Applied Mathematics, developing advanced theory and methods to understand complex, multidimensional, and non-equilibrium quantum systems. Dr. Kirin also serves as a scientific advisor for the AAAS Dialogue on Science, Ethics, and Religion. His essays on human knowledge, systems, and spirituality have appeared in various media outlets, including the Los Angeles Review of Books, Granta, and Plow. We have more than 300 participants registered for this session, many of whom are already in the space. We welcome you again to the university on behalf of the lab. We have countries represented literally from A to Z in this space, from Australia, Brazil, Canada, Denmark, Ethiopia, Finland, Germany, Ghana, India, Italy, Kazakhstan, Kenya, Korea, Norway, Portugal, South Africa, Spain, Sweden, Trinidad and Tobago, Turkey, United Arab Emirates, United Kingdom, the U.S and Zimbabwe. As our beloved son of the university, who was Stokely Carmichael when he was here, but who was known to the world as Kwame Ture noted, at Howard, you have everything in the African world and its opposite. We are so excited for this opportunity today to welcome Ngugi Watiango back to the campus. We were talking a bit in the green room about the year that all of the freshmen at the university read something torn and new. Welcome back to the space, Professor Ngugi, and thank you so much, Professor Kirian, for this opportunity. Welcome, and I look forward to hearing more from you in the chat and uh, during the question and answer session. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Dean Williams, for that kind introduction. We are so excited to be here today for um, this lecture by Professor Gugi Wationgo. Um, I'm excited to be the moderator and host, and this is actually part of a very intriguing space that we're calling Decolonizing the History and the Future of Knowledge. So I'll begin by saying Kwimeni Tanya, which is a Gakuyu phrase of introduction. And so you all might be wondering, why would a quantum scientist and a group of quantum physicists be at all interested in decolonization? So I'll tell you why. Um, colonial, post-colonial, and neo-colonial mindsets affect all our knowledge systems, from literature, history, and economics, to the natural sciences, and even mathematics. So science has for too long in the modern era been dominated by these monstrously unscientific narratives. Um, these, they're ahistorical and yet they're popular, including the belief that intellectual inquiry began only with the Greeks. And they're recycled repeatedly by speakers who are generally ignorant of anything to the contrary. 
So ignorance, however, as we know, um, can be a very dangerous thing, especially when it comes to the stories we tell and the worlds that we inhabit and shape. So the QBL at Howard was created as an interdisciplinary space in which a different type of discussion could be encouraged and welcomed. We are a group of thinkers dedicated to the manifold mystery of how distinct first person subjectives can co-experience a third person reality. Today, we're building a renewed vision of that reality together. So in December, uh, we kicked off our decolonizing series with uh, the global historian of ideas, Dag Herbjorn Srud. He presented on redefining the canon in science and philosophy. And on MLK Day, Professor Ruha Benjamin of Princeton University highlighted how artificial intelligence and big data informed realities can reproduce structural racism, even as its own type of technology. So DAG, Professor Benjamin, and I will be your panel respondents today after Professor Googie's lecture. So we're, of course, going to be responding to uh, this wonderful soul here, the esteemed theorist, linguist, essayist, novelist, and playwright Googie Watiango. He's author of the seminal work, Decolonizing the Mind. He was arrested and imprisoned without charge in the 1970s for mobilizing Kenyans against British neo-imperialism or colonialism through his plays and other writings. And in the last six decades, he has produced such a wide, deep, and revolutionary body of work that we trust the Nobel Committee will not be so foolish as to not continue to overlook. Like many luminaries and sages throughout history, his commitment to the least of these and finding riches among them led to his persecution by the prevailing elites in Kenya and beyond. The painful tribulations that he, his wife, and his family have endured even in the last two decades should remind us all of the incredibly high price that must be paid when we walk in the path of truth. But the heights of Professor Googie's truth can only be matched by the humility of its beginnings. He wrote his first novel, Devil on the Cross, which I have here, he wrote it on prison-issued toilet paper. It's the first modern novel ever written in Gukuyu, and Googie's choice to write in his native tongue has been compared to Chaucer's decision to write in the vernacular English rather than Latin. He has been honored for both his writing and self-translation, with his novel The Perfect Nine being the first work written in an indigenous African language to be long-listed for the International Booker Prize just last year. So after being named an Amnesty International Prisoner of Conscience, he was released in 1978 and went into exile, working with the London-based Committee for the Release of Political Prisoners. Googie has since held appointments at the University of Nairobi, New York University, Yale University, and Northwestern University, and is the recipient of numerous awards and elections. Since 2002, he has served at UC Irvine as Distinguished Professor of English and Comparative Literature and the Founding Director of the International Center for Writing and Translation. At ICWT, they took their motto, Culture Contact as Oxygen, from Aimé Césaire's Discourse on Colonialism, in which Césaire writes that whatever its own particular genius may be, a civilization that withdraws into itself atrophies that for civilizations, exchange is oxygen. In Googie's 2012 tour de force, Globalectics, Theory and the Politics of Knowing, he revisits the Hegelian dialectic from the vantage point of the post-colonial, the oppressed, and the global South. There is a fundamental and surprising asymmetry and reminiscent of Du Bois in his celebrated notion of double consciousness, Googie advocates a unified consciousness where we become an inheritor of two worlds, rather than merely the dominant given of the colonial subjugator. Global Lectics, as you will hear today in his lecture, empowers us to read, to write, to work, to think and love with an augmented vision. So as Professor Googie puts it, Global Lectics is the mutual containment of hereness and thereness in time and space, where time and space are also in each other. It's the Blakeian vision of a world in a grain of sand and eternity in an hour. It can thus speak to our own cultural present and our physics, even as we speak to it from our own cultural present. This web of connections reflects the language of nature, 
The various aspects of nature are in active communications within themselves. Just as we are in now communication, the cells in our body are in communication, and the atoms and molecules making up those are in communication. So this is our task today, to probe those hidden connections, and we will do so at the feet of a masterful stylist, a consummate intellectual, and a moving voice for decolonization. So please mute your microphones if you're not Professor Googie. Put all your questions in the chat where we'll curate them, and we will try to address as many as we can from there after the lecture. So we welcome your wisdom, Brother Googie. Rathim Womuno. Hey, no ega, no ega mono. <laughs> now, language and decolonization of the cognitive process. All over the world, particularly in the formerly colonized world, there is a growing call and even demands for decolonization. Quite a good number of books now bear titles that in one form or another include the word decolonize. Indeed, decolonial studies is emerging as a new distinct field of inquiry in the academy. My book, Decolonizing the Mind, which I published in 1986, has now become a central text in the decolonial movement. So <laughs> I have to confess, there's nothing new <laughs> in my talk tonight. <laughs> it is a revisit of the issues that I raised then and that I have continued raising in some of my recent books, uh, including Moving the Center, Sounding Pond New. And by the way, I was very honored by Howard University when some years ago, uh, they made all the students uh, in this, in the university, <laughs> read my book, Something Torn and New, which is really about the politics of memory. And it's very, very important uh, to me, uh, but I think also to, well, <laughs> to think about the world today. Anyway, Something Torn and New. I was very honored by Howard University. And I was, ah, uh, Howard University has put so many uh, black intellectuals will be so important in all our lives. Yeah, anyway, thank you. So another is like globalectics, yeah. In one form or another, these texts address different aspects of decolonization. But decolonization cannot be divorced from colonization, for decolonization is clearly a negation of the colonial process. They are connected. So it behoves us to look uh, uh, into the colonial process, the better to understand decolonization at a personal national, continental, pan-African and global level, and the role of language in all this. Personal colonization is a total process. <laughs> Simply put, it was a hostile takeover of the totality of the cognitive process ecology, economy, politics, the body, soul, and mind of one people by another. Yeah. It is total, it's a totality. Yeah. Mm. Colonialism had clear economic aim. 
to create wealth for the colonizer. And I want to remind those in America that what we call the United States of America today was a settler colony, okay? Dependent almost entirely on black people, black, uh, black power. <laughs> In other words, to create wealth, we must remember that, please, yeah. So colonialism had a clear economic aim to create wealth for the colonizer, okay? But total economic control is not possible without political power. <laughs> Military conquest always precede the takeover of land and the establishment of a colonial state. Economic and political control, again, in themselves, cannot be effective without cultural control, right? right? Again, they are connected. Culture developed over time carries the entire body of values by which communities and individual view themselves. That is their relation to self and to the world. Their cultures embody the moral, ethical, and aesthetic values. And the totality of these values is based on their individual and collective sense of self. This sense of self, with all its spiritual and mental energies, is what drives the community. Colonize this, and you have effectively made uh, them see the world, even their own bondage, through the eyes of the colonizer. Colonization of culture begins and climaxes in the colonization of the cognitive process. Call it simply the process of knowledge acquisition. Okay. Remember, the normal cognitive process is a simple act of from here to there, <laughs> from where I am to there. Huh? When I want to travel, I want to I start from where I am. <laughs> Even Howard, that's where I start. I don't, I don't fly to New York to start my journey from New York. I mean, you start from Howard to California <laughs> and back, right? Uh, so the, the normal cognitive process is a simple act of from here to there. Even children begin by their ear, their ear, their mother's body was around them. And then they be to see connection between that and other and contrast with other experience and so on. They go on adding, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> knowledge, <laughs> like any journey, begins where you are. The more you know of here, where you are, the more you know of its relationship to there. And the more you know of there, <laughs> the more you know of here <laughs> and the relation of here to there. It is a dialectical process of mutual illumination and change. But note, colonialism completely turns that normal cognitive process of here to there into its opposite, <laughs> from there to here. <laughs> In other words, for the imperial center to whatever, to the colonized uh, 
paraphrase you like. Knowledge of the imperial center becomes the beginning of all knowledge. To know self, you must first know the imperial other, right? Is from imperial to you, not the other way around. Now, language is a key in the cognitive process. Language is what enables us our effective relationship to one another, to the land, to the production of material and spiritual wealth. Language, as I've stated in my book, Decolonizing the Mind, is a memory bank of a people. The colonial takeover of our languages contains the early form of what they now might call <laughs> cyber warfare, <laughs> right? <laughs> it started with, the, <laughs> with us, okay. Mm -hmm. And they went for the jugular, <laughs> the key that held the totality of economics, politics, and culture, which is language. And as I said, language is key to the cognitive process. Every language, even if spoken by her people or a million people, has the best knowledge of the here of its existence, right? Because in the ecology, that vocabulary or that is developed in the ecology of the area, you know. Um, they tell me the people who live in uh, Alaska have, have uh, you know, they have uh, hundreds of names for different aspects of snow, for reason, mm -hmm. because they lived, they live with it. So every language, even if spoken by five people, has the best knowledge of the here, of its environment, of its existence. Uh, but colonialism <laughs> said that it, its languages <laughs> were not they were the best depositor of knowledge. In fact, they were the original deposit of knowledge. All knowledge begin with the colonial languages. The colonized had to see themselves through the eyes of imperialism. And by the way, I don't just I might let me just say this. for those who we, for those of us for those of us in America, please to remember eh, that as part of the conditioning of African bodies to slavery and so on was the banning of African languages, right? First thing, you know, in the plantation, no African languages, no African, not even the talking drum. And some people were hung, you know, but we can come back to that, you know, uh, why language is so primary, even in that process of, ensla of uh, uh, enslaving African people. Uh, in other words, uh, the colonized were supposed to see themselves through the eyes of the imperial center. If you bear with me, I would like to look at the various histories of colonial conquest to see this in operation. And we might as well begin with one of the English, earliest English settler colonies, which is Ireland. <laughs> and there's a way in which Ireland became the historical nursery of patterns of power relationship 
that will be reproduced in states born and others then not unborn, not yet born. Following the Anglo Norman conquest and settlement of Ireland, the various occupants of the English crown enacted several acts aimed at protecting English language against the subversive encroachment of Irish or Gaelic, which were more developed in terms of culture and production at the time than either English or French. Mm. Among other penalties, the 1366 Statute of Kilkenny, and you can Google that one, <laughs> the 1366 Statute of Kilkenny. This that among other things, it is threatened to confiscate any lands of any English or any Irish living among them who would use Irish among themselves, contrary to ordinance. And we're talking about Ireland, not England. <laughs> they say you cannot speak Irish uh, near the English settlement, even if you're Irish. By 16th century, the ordinances, and there were very many, had failed to achieve their end. The Irish went on resisting. So in 1598 comes Edmund Spencer. As you know, Spencer was a contemporary of Shakespeare, you know, known for such books as the Fairy Queen and uh, others of him. Anyway, in 1958, in, no, in 1598, Edmund Spencer published his book, A View of Ireland at the Present Time, a dialogic manifesto on how to tame the Irish through the erasure of their memory. Naming and language were the suggested instruments to that end. For as one of the interlocutors in the dialogue says, and I quote the book, it had ever been the use of the conqueror to despise the language of the conquered. And so remember that it, he says it is all it has ever been the use of the conqueror to despise the language of the conquered and to force him, the conquered, by all means to learn his. You know? Now, this is very interesting for those of us who are now living or African many people. What a rally was Spencer's settler neighbor in an area called Munster, and it's still called Munster today. I've been there <laughs> to talk about this, by the way. What a rally was Spencer's settler neighbor in Munster, and he would go on to found Virginia, the first apparently truly English colony in the Americas. Now, in the American slave or plantation of the enslaved that followed the English settlements, African languages, including the drums, would later be banned. Some of those breaking the ban, earning the news around their necks. Also, their names. <laughs> they had taken the names of their masters, you know. The name is the most personal, is the most starting point of any, you know, yeah. You take away those names, you say, 
that they can, they, their bodies now carry the name of the plantation owner. Mm. Yeah. Violence against one's own name and language. Sounds familiar? Well, let's take a few more examples. Let's go to New Zealand, uh, where, by the way, at the University of Auckland, I first gave those lectures that later became the book, Decolonizing the Mind. At the end of the lectures, there were four of them, but connected. Hmm? A Maori woman met me outside and she offered me a gourd with some drawing on it. This was he told me, you don't even have to know my name, but I want you to know, she told me, that you were not talking about Kenya. In my talks, I talked, all my examples had come from Kenya, my own experience. But now she tells me, I want you to know that you are not talking about Kenya, but us, Maori people. She not elaborate, but I stuck in my mind because I had not mentioned the Maori situation because I knew little about it then. So I did not quite understand until 2014, that years later, after seeing the Maori woman, when 2014, I accepted another invitation to speak at SAMI, S-A-M-I, Language College in Northern Norway. Now, Sami people inhabit parts of Sweden, Finland, and Russia. Again, my talk was on decolonization. After my presentation, an elder approached me and he says, how do you know so much about us, the Sami people? Which of course reminded me of my encounter in New Zealand with the Maori lady. Because in both cases, because I didn't know the histories, I had mentioned the parallels. So what were the particulars in my lectures on decolonization that made these two, one Pacific and the other European, see my experiences in colonial Kenya of 1938 to 1963, that's when I was born, as equal equally applying to the Maori and Sami experiences? Uh, the answer, or part of the answer, lies in a 2015 testimony of one Dover Samuels, a Maori politician to the Waitangi Commission about his experiences of school in New Zealand. Caught speaking Maori, he said, and I quote his testimony, you be hurled out in front of the rest of the class and told to bend over. The teacher would have, he had this container, which had a number of vines of supple jack out of the bush, not from the school. You'd bend over and he would stand back and give you what they called then six of the best. On many occasions, not only did it leave bruises behind on my thighs, but drew blood. Why? For speaking Maori, right? The Sami people in Norway went through a similar experience in a period between 1870 and 1970. 
what uh sorry about this uh, some people in know went through a similar experience in a period between 1870 and 1970 what they call the brutal years in an attempt to turn them into fluent Norwegian speakers. Though that was now in the past, and Norway obviously now supported some language, the memory of it must have been uh, must have been awakened by my talk, you know. Uh, and that's why the elder reacted in that way. What then? seemed to unite the reaction to my election in New Zealand in 1984 and in Norway in 2014 was the fact that on both occasions I had talked about the fact that my education into English included being beaten, if caught speaking a koyo, my language, in any part of the school grounds. The value of English, in my case, was dependent on the devaluation of the coil. And I want to repeat that it's not simply a matter of knowing another language, which is always a good thing to do. Hmm? But no, <laughs> the two had to go together. Okay. Valuation of English, the value it was dependent, was rooted in a devaluation of the coil. A similar thread, violence against native languages runs through the spread of English in Scotland, Wales, and America, of course, among native peoples. In Wales, those that spoke Welsh in the school compound were made to stand in front of the class, humiliated, with a placard, where not, hanging from their necks. In America, in his book, My People of the Sioux, S-I-O-U-X, the author, Luther Standing Bear, dramatizes this in the education of Native Americans. The book <laughs> tells of his experience as among the first Native American children to attend school, to learn to speak, read, and write English at the Carlisle Indian School in Pennsylvania. It's still there by the Carlisle School, it was one of the first, okay? Yeah. The boarding school was opened in 1879, the very first of such school for Native Americans, which became the model for others tomorrow, or they call variously uh, at town, resident schools or whatever. On entering a classroom a few days after the arrival, Luther and fellow students found a lot of marks on the blackboard. They were English names, and each student had to pick one. Then the teacher would take a piece of white tape, write a name on it, and then cut off, uh, cut off a length of the tape and sew it on the back of the boy's shirt. Soon, they all had the names of white men sewed on their backs. Now, no. violence against the use of their own rank followed. In 1892, Captain Richard Pratt, the founder of Carlisle, articulated the vision that had guided him in founding, this, in founding the school as kill the Indian in him, save the man. Remember the phrase, kill the Indian, save the man. 
the idea of killing the native to save him through their reincarnation as new colonial language speakers, speaking beings, had been stated more eloquently or as eloquently by one uh, Englishman called Macaulay in his policy for education in colonial India. When in the famous 1834 minute on Indian education, he advocated English as a medium of education to replace Sanskrit and Persian in order to create a class of people, Indian in blood and color, but otherwise English in mentality and everything else. In other words, a linguistically westernized middleman would automatically carry out the intent of the ruler to the mother rule because they would be have the same mentality. They don't have to be instructed. Okay. Of course, whether they turn out to do that or not, that's a different question altogether. Yeah. Now, let's give you another example. Pierre Foncini, uh, a founder of Alliance Fran Francais. These are kind of institutions for teaching, spreading French language all over the world. Okay particularly the colonies. And by the way, right now, <laughs> French language is, <laughs> is African people who now carry, <laughs> a French, who keep French language alive, okay? <laughs> anyway, this is what Pierre Fonsen said, and he's quoted in a book by Walter Rodney, How Europe and a Developed Africa. <laughs> so he says the same thing on the French that it was necessary to attach the colonies, that is the French colony, to the metropole, that is Paris, by every solid psychological bond against the day when the progressive emancipation ends or when they might become some kind of independent, but they'll still be connected to Paris, to France that they be and they remain French in language, thought, and spirit. Those are not my words. Eh? They are the words of a founder of the Alliance Francais, you know, that they remain French. They remain French in language, thought, and spirit, okay? Now, even the 18th century struggle for the standardization of English had an imperial intent. According to one, I was, this was, this was my son, Mokoma Angu, drew attention to this, to me, to this, um, uh, an article by, I, I don't know him, but he's called uh, Adam Beach. Hmm? According to Adam Arab Beach, according to Mokoma, Standard English would become the building block of a, a metaphysical empire, an empire of language and literature that outlived the actual physical empire. This was him describing the role of standardization of English. Yeah. Metaphysical empires create colonies of the mind, mental colonial satellites that permanently orbit around the imperial sun. The colony of the mind prevents meaningful or nationally empowering innovations in education, in particular, the language of education in the literal sense of the verbal systems and the symbolic in the sense of all the non-verbal means used to educate. It can prevent a people from taking steps to secure their base, or even once they might allow others to raid their base 
or even aid them in doing so. Yeah. I want to repeat something we have said in South Africa recently that Europe, I'm trying to sum up the case of Africa today, uh, that Europe gave Africa the resources of their accent. Africa gave Europe access to the resources of the continent, right? So remember that, please. Accents and access. Okay? I give you accent, you give me access to your wealth. Accents for access. That is the story of the colonization of the cognitive process, <laughs> right? I give you accents and I give access to your body, to what your body produces, what your mind produces, right? Accents for access. That is the story of the colonization of the cognitive process. But the pattern emerging in the context of colonize and colonies, victor and vanquished, may actually uh, be part of the in any structures of inequality. In other words, in any structure of inequality, even what we call democracy, we have to look at the question of the cognitive process, <laughs> because often it's obscured, okay? It's where the connections, you know. Some say even this may, may actually be part of the education system in any structure of inequality. Any education may become a process of mystifying knowledge and its acquisition, the cognitive process, right? You know, things are not connected. Yeah? Poverty and wealth are not connected. Huh? There is nothing to do with this and that and the other, right? They are separate, right? So even education may become mystifying knowledge and acquisition uh, may uh, the cognitive process. Here, I have to make a distinction between education and knowledge. Knowledge, what we call, call, we call omenyo, <laughs> omenyo, knowledge is a question of continuously adding to what we already know. Is basically a system of from here to there, there to here, in a dialectical play of mutual impact and illumination, right? The normal cognitive process starts from the known to the unknown. But every new step makes the unknown known and therefore adds to what's already known. The new known enriches the already known and so on in a continuous journey of making connection. Knowledge of the world begins where one is. And such knowledge is power. But education, as both knowledge, is really a mode of conditioning a person to make them fit into and function in a given society, no matter how it is structured. It may involve transfer of knowledge, but it's also, but it is conditioned knowledge, branded by the world outlook of the educator and the education system. 
because an education system also carries a world view, right? Like whether you see it's connected or not connected, whether you see it from here to there or there to here. In the context of extremes of wealth and power in any society, education as knowledge transfer can never be neutral. Yeah. Especially in the context of the dominating and dominated. This is clearer in a colonizer and colonized. And I repeat, the colonial process was always a negation of the normal cognitive process. Europe, its names, its geography, its history and knowledge was always seen as a starting point of the education journey of the colonized. In short, colonization in the area of education was always predicted on the negation of the colonized space as a starting point of knowledge. In the area of languages, it meant a negation of people's languages as valid sources and depositories of knowledge in or intellectual and that is inquiry, right? In the end, it created in a colonized elite, the mentality of the outsider looking in, a mental attitude that persists in a post-colonial era today. That's why, for instance, in Africa, there'll be money for, <laughs> there's still money meant for government officers will take money meant for alleviation, say, of a certain problem. They'll pocket it and, and it's seen as normal, okay? So in the end, such a system of education creates the, uh, in, in the colonizing, the mentality of the outsider looking in, a mental attitude that was in the post-colonial world. I call it today the, the uh, normalization of the abnormalities of the colonial system. <laughs> yeah, you normalize abnormality and you try to build a society or not normalize abnormality, okay? Like the abnormality of seeing things, <laughs> of not starting from where you are connecting, but you start from where you are not, right? Okay, that is normalized abnormality of the colonial system. We want, we can see it in a way, the post-colonial elite want to erase their names, the skin color of their body even, their languages. They distrust their bodies. They distrust their geography. They distrust their culture. And they distrust their history as valid starting point in the journey into the world. We see it in a continuous intellectual and emotional habit of post-colonial elite and even governments of linking to Europe and the West for validation, right? Yeah. They don't trust what's produced from within, somehow or other, until it's validated from a uh, imperial centers. We don't trust national initi initiatives in knowledge, inventions even, unless it earns a measure of approving admiration from the West. We always hear applauses of pride and approval for knowledge obtained from the imperial metropolis. Very, very muted applause for knowledge obtaining national. And let me tell you this, which is very personal, this one, it really makes me want to, oh, in Kenya today, there are schools run by very wealthy Africans and political leaders. Huh? 
meant to promote British national curriculum. Can you imagine an African person in Kenya, which was colonized by British for I don't know how many years, in independent era, investing money and resources to promote British national curriculum to Kenyan African children. Again, a case of normalized abnormality. Anyway, we always hear a process of pride and approval for knowledge obtained from the imperial metropolis, but very muted applause for knowledge obtained in national institutions. Some of our institutions become copies of those abroad. <laughs> and there's no originality in copying because even the best copy is still a copy. In short, lack of roots in one starting base creates a state of permanent uncertainty about one's abilities, achievement even. And remember, it's very different. If you start where you are with you, go on adding, you go empowering yourself because you can see connections, right? There's no mystery, okay? Anyway, it even warps one's dreams and ambitions, like the desire to identify with that which is farthest removed from self. Therefore, decolonization has to mean really completely the negation, you like, of the negation of the colonial process. Yeah? It should mean the liberation of the totality of a people's economy, politics, and culture by rooting them in the ordinary working man and woman. Yeah? You cannot talk. You can have a society where people are going about unhoused against skyscrapers and other policies, really. And with the you know, knowledge, <laughs> sorry. Uh, so we are talking about liberation, liberation of the totality of our people's economy, politics, and culture by rooting them in the ordinary working man and woman. Knowledge is power. And if you want every man, and woman of the continent in Africa to be an empowered producer, then empower them with knowledge. And knowledge starts where and wherever we are. Our languages are valid sources of knowledge, but you go on adding to that. Eh? There's nothing wrong in my knowing Koyo and Kiswahili and English and French. And, but there's not everything wrong. I must say, no, I must obliterate my Koyo language and become a master of whatever. I say again, <coughs> you realize knowledge starts where and wherever we are. Our languages, whatever they are, are valid sources of knowledge. We can all reach the stars, but we don't have to first migrate to Europe and other imperial centers physically or metaphorically in order to reach the stars. The problem In any one country or the world is not the existence of many languages and cultures and even religions, but their relations in terms of hierarchy. The view that my culture, my religion is of a higher order than yours. In terms of religion, for reason, the statement that 
my God is more of a God than your God is very ungodly. In terms of languages, this view leads some people to see their own languages as inherently more of language than other languages, right? <laughs> This placement of languages in a hierarchy is what in other areas are called linguistic feudalism. All languages, big and small, have a lot to contribute to our common humanity if freed from linguistic feudalism. Education policies should be devised on the basis that all languages are treasuries of beauty and possibility. They have something to give to each other if their relationship is that of the give, uh, equal give and take of a network. Even if one of the languages should emerge as a language of communication across many languages, it should not be so on the basis of or is assumed, assumed inherent nationness or globality, but on the basis of need and necessity. And even then, such a language should not grow on the graveyard of other languages. Network of equal give and take, not a hierarchy of the rider and the horse. Okay. I once called for the moving of the center from one of my books from its current imperial location <coughs> to its real place among ordinary peoples of the earth. The language that these communities speak and use, which are also the sites of their culture and knowledge of ecology accumulated over the years to be the building block of a shared national and global human culture. In other words, a national or even global human culture should be rooted in the particularities of this language, however small. Please decolonize the cognitive process. Let me, well, let me just say there's a few other. Monolingualism is the carbon monoxide of culture. And I'm taking Ali, I'm elaborating on uh, Amy Cesare uh, with his statement, you know, uh, uh, culture contact is the oxygen of civilization. Anyway, monolingualism is the carbon monoxide of culture. The carbon monoxide is even more poisonous when it is a monolingualism of a colonial language. On the other hand, multilingualism is the oxygen of a national, even global culture. <laughs> but it has to be a multilingualism that begins with the language of one's own culture as the base. If you know all the languages of the world, but abandon your mother tongue or the language of your culture, that's enslavement. But you know the language of your culture and add all the other languages of the world to it, that's empowerment. What's wrong with that, ladies and gentlemen? Empowerment. What we want is the empowerment of all peoples of the world. In the case of the African continent, my continent, this empowerment should be the strategic vision that guides our tactical maneuvers. I believe that if we root ourselves in our base among the people, there's no hill, there's no mountain that we cannot climb. Rooted in our base, we can effect effectively compete with the most and what with any other people, but on again, this of give and take. Now, let's remember this, and please 
let's make a study of ancient Egypt, compulsory more or less, or recommended in all black schools anywhere in the world. You know, it's a civilization, no matter what you think of it, that lasted for about three to 5,000 years. So, my friends, once we were leaders in thought, in in technology, in science, in astronomy. Eh? Many people travel from Greece, from all over to go to Egypt to learn, right? All the leading scholars of Mediterranean Europe used to make trips to the Egypt of black pharaohs. What we did then, we can do so again. For me, if you ask me, the best of Africa has yet to be. But it must start with a complete decolonization of lands, economies, politics, and culture. And most important, the decolonization of the cognitive process. Remember, we can all reach the stars, but from where, from our grounds. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Gugi, for, it's such a clarion call to all of us at historically black schools and colleges, historically black institutions in this country, um, predominantly black spaces, or uh, black spaces in predominantly white institutions to, to value not only black lives and black thought, but to see ourselves in the light of that greatness and that history that we've often been so separated from. Um, so today in response to your talk, before we start engaging the audience and their questions, there's been a lot going on in the chat. We, we have two panel respondents um, and myself, so we're gonna, uh, as a response to your lecture, begin with Dag Herb Jornsrud uh, from the Skokie uh, Center for Global and Comparative History in Oslo, Norway. Dag, uh, are you there? Can you uh, respond to Professor Googie's lecture? Yes, um, thank you so much. This was uh, mind blowing and so inspiring. Um, yeah, I hope the sound is all fine. Yes. You hear me? Oh, we hear yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So thank you so much um, for such a great uh, lecture. And um, I can confirm that uh, your very vital points about the Sami people of Scandinavia, those points were very um, to the point and very correct. Uh, and I just want to add that this um, challenge that the Sami people, the native people of the native peoples of Scandinavia, um, those challenges are, how to say, as bad today as they were a couple of decades ago. Okay, some things have, how to say, changed for the better, for sure, but there is so much more to do when it comes to the um, to the uh, rights of the land, for example, there are huge challenges. Uh, I guess something similar that we can see in North America as well when it comes to the First Nations of the Americas. So, um, okay, so I um, have so many uh, things to say about this lecture, uh, or if I would like to add, uh, one thing that comes to mind, I'm just, I'm thinking about one of the great revolutionary heroes of Haiti in the 1790s, Toussaint L'Ouverture. And he had, he put it in this way that, okay, in order to start the revolution in Haiti, remember in the 1790s, this was, it was a successful revolution in the end. In 1804, they uh, freed themselves from the French and became the first 
a free black nation without slavery in the Americas and in the world actually. And he said in a letter in 1791, approximately, um, he wrote, and I do have the quote here, that um, uh, the challenge, um, it starts with the mind. And so he says, um, for too long, we have, um, we have been chained without thinking of uh, removing the chains, you know? So he started this revolution with the cognitive process, so to say, as well, you know? So yes, it's about bondage, about um, physical things, but he stressed that the most important thing was to start with the mind and to know that, as he said in the letter, that, you know, whites have no rights to enslave the blacks. And uh, I think that's, that's um, something that this lecture by Gogi um, builds upon, so to say. A another thing, well, if I do have one more minute, um, I was just reading the other day, uh, the 1619 book, um, the 1619 project book, um, by Nicole Hannah Jones. And um, it has become, as you might know, very controversial. There are like 24 states or something in the US now and trying to ban this book or there are plans about banning this book. But you know, it, it starts the whole, um, it gives a new narrative, so to say, about how to understand the US. And there is like one sentence there, um, Hannah Jones, she writes in her, in her intro that, um, um, let's see, it, it, that we should not, um, um, that, that, that the facts will not destroy us. Uh, that was a paraphrase. The facts will not destroy us, uh, and, uh, which is very vital. Uh, at the same time, I'm just rem reminded of the lecture uh, on January 17th by um, Ruha Benjamin, uh, where she said, you know, that um, the facts, facts are not enough. We, we need to have more than just facts in order to change. And, and I think that this is one of the great um, possibilities that quantum biolab creates by you know, connecting people from different disciplines. You know that, yes, maybe we need more than facts. We need new, new narratives, new possibilities. And I, I think that's exactly what Google uh, you know, advocates and um, with his writing. We, we need more, how to say, great narratives and met metaphors like he, he made when it comes to accents and access, right? So such narratives are so vital, you know, for us in order to make a change because um, if we don't do anything, I mean, things will just continue. Right, and it this colonial narrative has been going on, and the white supremacy um, it has been going on for yeah 500, 300 years now, especially when it comes to the educational system. And I do think there is time to make a change. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dag. Um, Professor Gugi, before we go on to our next respondent, was there something you'd like to respond to? I don't know. I just want to swallow the, <laughs> to digest the comments. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Okay. No, I, I love what you said, Dag, about facts and knowledge certainly is not enough. And as uh, Professor Benjamin spoke to us last month, uh, knowledge certainly comes with a perspective and it must be deployed in different contexts with perspective. And so uh, now we have Professor Ruha Benjamin of Princeton University who will be 
um, responding to Professor Googie's lecture. Ruha, Thank are you there? You. Yes, I am. Can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Perfect. Okay, wonderful. So thank you so much for that stimulating talk, Professor Ngugi, to Professor Kurian and the Quantum Bio Lab for just hosting us tonight. Good evening, everyone. It's truly an honor uh, just to be in conversation, to think with you all. Um, there were so many strands of the talk that resonated and so, so many connections that sparked with my own work. So I'm forcing myself to just try to limit to two, two points for further reflection. And those two points are what I would refer to as one computational colonialism as the first strand and a poetics of the future as a second strand. So in reflecting on the main theme that we're gathered here to think about decolonizing the cognitive process, it won't surprise any of you, especially those who attended my talk a few months ago, that what came to mind for me was the whole idea of artificial intelligence. By that, I mean the epistemologies, the industries, the imaginaries that are codifying a particular theory of the mind in our digital infrastructures and selling it to us as a universal good. In particular, I thought about how much has come to light since 2012 when Professor Ngugi described technology in global ethics in these terms. Indeed, by road, sea, air, and even space, every corner of the globe is connected, consolidating the global character of production, exchange, and consumption. Information technology has turned our planet, our planet into a neighborhood. Disasters or triumphs in one part of the globe can be witnessed in real time in every other part. The ebook is more instant than instant coffee, he wrote. International conferences, real or virtual, are the order of the day. Little could he have imagined Zoom, the Zoom world we live in now. What we've witnessed over the last 10 years is how these digital connections go far beyond cultural exchange, go far beyond economic convenience to include what has been variously described as algorithms of oppression by Noble, racialized surveillance by Brown, weapons of math destruction by O'Neill, surveillance capitalism by Zuboff, and what I've called the new Jim Code in my own work. And then with an eye to global power relations, these dynamics have been named variously, data colonialism by Coldry and Mahias, or algorithmic colonialism by Muhammad and colleagues. But for the sake of alliteration, let's call this phenomenon computational colonialism. Computational colonialism, as I'm thinking about it, builds on Professor Googie's critique of prestige languages like English, French, and German, to which we can add programming languages like Python, JavaScript, and R as the new prestige languages that encode power and push out other ways of knowing our shared reality. In a 2020 paper in the journal Philosophy and Technology by Muhammad Ping and Isaac, which I'll drop in the chat in just a bit, the author, authors remind us, digital spaces created by the internet and the increasingly networked systems and devices we use form digital territories that like physical spaces have the propensity to become sites of extraction and exploitation and thus the sites of digital territorial col coloniality. The coloni coloniality of power, they write, can be observed in digital structures in the form of sociocultural imaginations, knowledge systems, and the ways of developing and using technology, which are based on systems, institutions, and values that persist from the past and remain unquestioned in the present. In 2019, when I visited Nairobi for the Deep Learning in Daba conference, that brought together data scientists from across the continent. One of the things I was struck by were the social dimensions of the booming FinTech industry throughout the country, FinTech being short for financial technologies. 
The official feel good rhetoric of this industry is financial inclusion along the lines of international organizations and governments united around this goal of banking the unbanked. At the heart of FinTech are mobile apps that allow people to transfer cash and make payments on cell phones without a bank account and get, and get easy access to credit, valorizing the role of markets to improve people's lives. People once excluded from credit, the story goes, can now access capital to improve their short and long-term prospects. And I say story, because we are not just talking about a set of economic relations mediated by new technologies, but also about a set of narratives, a dominant techno utopian tale, which is sold and settled in more and more territories around the globe. With FinTech, as in other contexts, capturing global markets goes hand in hand with capturing our imagination. As one Nairobian put it succinctly, these apps give you money gently, and then they come for your neck. While another said that the apps are, quote, enslaving people, as many take out loans with one mobile service to repay existing debts for another lending service, a treadmill, a debt treadmill that's hard to escape. One report I read described it thus, Kenyans are being driven into circuits of financial capital that are premised not as the marketing would have it, on empowerment, but on the profitability of perpetual debt. It's important to point out here that two of the most prominent FinTech apps are Tala and Branch. From their California headquarters, these firms export Silicon Valley's curious nexus of technology, finance, and developmentalism. Quickly downloaded onto Kenya's proliferating smartphones and utilizing the country's ubiquitous mobile transfer, uh, money transfer system, these apps mine people's devices and social media accounts for signs of their credit worthiness. While their lending algorithms are closely guarded secrets, industry insiders suggest an ambitious effort to track everyday behavior and social relations. While these firms offer little transparency to the public, they tell investors that money is pouring in. Each time a loan is taken out, more user data is harvested allowing companies to develop better predictions on the rates of repayment of a given customer. What's more like an episode ripped right from the TV series Black Mirror, the fintech sector capitalizes on the social stigma associated with debt. Another of these apps, Okash, took this logic of stigmatization to an extreme, harvesting users' contacts and calling bosses, parents, friends to shame defaulters into repaying. And this stigma has real material effects when not only loan appraisers, but would-be employers are demanding to see people's credit reports in which many borrowers have been blacklisted. But of course, this is just one example, one instance of computational colonialism. In that paper I mentioned earlier titled Decolonial AI, the authors recount a number of other examples, Singapore's application of facial recognition in CCTV, India's Aadhaar identity system, Kenya's Huduma Namba biometric identity system, and the welfare interventions for Maori children by the New Zealand government, among many others. When companies use countries outside of their own as testing grounds, this phenomenon is called ethics dumping the export of harms and unethical research practices by companies to other countries. As just one example of this, the UK-based company Cambridge Analytica beta-tested algorithmic tools for the 2017 Kenyan and 2015 Nigerian elections with the intention to later deploy these tools in US and UK elections, which they did, which brought us Trump. Kenya and Nigeria were chosen in part due to the weaker data protection laws compared to Cambridge Analytica's base of operations in the UK, a clear example of ethics dumping. Which brings me to the second theme I'd like to briefly highlight, a poetics of the future, which connects to an idea prominent in global ethics um, imagination. Professor Ngugi explains, imagination is the most central formative agency in human society. An architect visualizes a building before he captures it on paper for the builder. Without imagination, 
We cannot visualize the past or the future. It's because we can imagine different futures that we can struggle against the present state of things. So by way of inciting our collective imagination around a decolonial approach to technology, I'm going to end now with an excerpt from the poetic essay, Technology and Ethos, written by Amira Baraka, circa 1969. Because as you'll see within this excerpt are a number of questions that I think can spark discussion and reflection. So back to Baraka. Machines are an extension of their inventor creators. Machines, the entire technology of the West is just that, the technology of the West. Nothing has to look or function the way it does. The West man's freedom unscientifically got at the expense of the rest of the world's people has allowed him to expand his mind, spread his sensibility wherever it could go and so shape the world and its powerful artifact engines. Political power is also the power to create, not only what you will, but to be free to go wherever you can go, mentally, physically as well. Black creation, creation powered by the Black ethos, brings very special results. And here are Baraka's questions. How do you communicate with the great masses of Black people? How do you use the earth to feed masses of people? How do you cure illness? How do you prevent illness? What are the Black purposes of space travel? These white scientists on lifetime fellowships or pondering problems at Princeton's Institute for Advanced Study, that's Baraka writing. So that a telephone is one culture's solution to the problem of sending words through space, a typewriter, why should it only make use of the tips of the fingers as contact points of flowing multi-directional creativity? If I invented a word placing machine, an expression scriber, if you will, then I would have a kind of instrument into which I could step and sit or sprawl or hang and use not only my fingers to make words express feelings, but elbows, feet, head, behind, and all the sounds I wanted, screams, grunts, taps, itches, I'd have magnetically recorded at the same time and translated into word, or perhaps even the final expressed thought, feeling would not be merely word or sheet, but itself, the expression, three-dimensional, able to be touched or tasted or felt or entered or heard or carried like a speaking, singing, constantly communicating charm. A typewriter is corny. The so-called fine artist realizes those of us who freed ourselves that our creations need not emulate the white man's, but it is time the engineers, architects, chemists, electronics craftsmen, Film too, radio, sound, that learning Western technology must not be the end of our understanding of the particular discipline we're involved in. Most of that West shaped information is like mud and sand. And when you're panning for gold, freed of an oppressor, but also as Toure has reminded, we must be free from the oppressor's spirit as well. It is this spirit as emotional construct that can manifest as expression, as art or technology or any form. But what is our spirit? What will it project? What machines will it produce? What will they achieve? What will be their morality? The new technology must be spiritually oriented because it must aspire to raise man's spirituality and expand man's consciousness. It must begin by being humanistic, though the white boy has yet to achieve this. Witness a technology that kills both plants and animals, poisons the air and degenerates or enslaves man. The technology itself must represent human striving. It must represent, at each point, the temporary perfection of the evolutional man and be obsolete only because nothing is ever perfect. The only constant is change. Baraka. Wow. wow. 
Thank you so much, Professor Benjamin. That is, I think we've we've all learned so much from you and Dag's response. I will, I, I, sitting kind of listening to both of you respond to Professor Googie's lecture. I mean, I'm I'm a humble quantum physicist and in that context, I feel many times the lack of imagination that the quote unquote hard sciences bring to the table. And I think we're limited by that. I think that there is a dearth of imagination that we have. Yes, there are rules, there are laws, but the perspective in which that science is conducted, the perspective in which we bring to the questions we ask about the natural world are deeply conditioned by our sociology, by our, um, our color, by uh, how the world perceives us and also how we perceive ourselves. And so when I think uh, in terms of the, the discussion around what do I bring as an individual subjective with a perspective to the questions of a world where there is a, um, a way to reproduce knowledge. There's Professor Ngugi mentioned to create copies of a copy, to be a simulacrum versus to be a reality, a bedrock behind the copy, something original, something spir of spirit, something of truth, right? How do, we, how do we do that as a subjective and how do we also do that as for those of you who are scientifically inclined or in the sciences, how do you then project into a world where we live in a third person reality, even though we are first person subjectives? This is, I think all of us would agree that there are truer statements than others. There are truer descriptions. There are truer representations of the realities that we're trying to present that no nation or culture or individual can contain the totality of truth, as Professor Agugi reminded us. But at the same time, we are all pointing to some reality that is transcendent. We are pointing to something that lies behind the appearances. And that just like a diamond is multifaceted, just as we cannot contain the fullness of an elephant like blind men and women in a room, we can then take our portion of it, the portion that we've been given, the portion that we can see and illuminate that as each of, as each of us have done in our own respective fields and everyone on this call is doing by illuminating that perspective to its fullest, we can shine the light on that part of reality that has been given to us. Um, I was so struck by this idea of normalized abnormality. Um, and in Global Ethics, Professor Googie really emphasizes this idea of order from chaos, right? In the beginning, what was in the beginning? Was it order and was it chaos? And how did those two combine to produce life? This is a central question in my own work, but it's also a question that a literary scholar, a theorist, um, a linguist, a fiction writer brings to the table of what did the order of British imperialism look like in Professor Googie's formative years? What sort of order was being imposed that was really chaotic violence upon the mind, among his peers, among his whole, among the entire culture's sense of what is valuable and what is um, worthy of pursuit. And I, I reflect on that because it's, it's so contingent upon the creation of life that we have enough room for the chaos to produce the order. There's, there's really beautiful physical law that describes the emergence of order from chaotic systems. And I think in what I see in uh, Gugi Wathiango's mind and in his work is a commitment to understanding a unified consciousness of order from this kind of parsed dialectic, this, this completely bifurcated consciousness that colonialism and neo-colonialism in our present day that we are all experiencing, if you're in the United States or if you feel the reverberations of the West, which is everyone on this call, 
then we are then walking in this bifurcated consciousness. In the, in the US context, Du Bois talked about it as a double consciousness, right? This sense of always seeing oneself outside, from outside oneself looking in rather than from within looking out. And you know, as many scientists at the Institute for Advanced Study um, and elsewhere have focused in the last century on what's called the quantum measurement problem. This is fundamentally an issue of how does one part of the universe observe another part of the universe objectively? What does it mean to have an objective, omniscient third person perspective in a physical world where every interaction, every web of connections produces um, a new system, right? When we measure things, when we take our devices and our smart phones and our algorithms, and we use them as measuring devices to conduct experiments in the world, we are measuring in a particular reference frame, in a particular context. And modern science affirms that. You know, 20th century physics, um, the, the cutting edge quantum science of the day affirms this reality that what we experience is relational that we experience an interaction when we measure and we experience uh, much more than an objective reality. There are many simultaneous realities going on. And so there's a deep connection between these kinds of ideas of a Kantian logic, which Professor Gugi describes in Global Lectics. What is the image that Kant, a man who we base most of West, our Western philosophy on, but who never left Konigsberg, the city of his birth, and yet was still uh, you know, seen as this sort of global thinker because he studied maps and things. But why is it that our philosophy and then our science, because Kantian logic has then influenced our science, how is it then that that Kantian logic becomes the paradigm? What, what could we say if a scientist uh, like myself or my colleagues would look more to the works of Professor Gugi and to look at a globalectic imagination where yes, there may be no relational center on a globe. All perspectives must be taken into consideration. But Professor Gugi, I believe is not arguing for a lack of some truth. It's just that that truth cannot be contained within any one culture, any one individual, any one persona. And so I want to, as we open up the conversation for Professor Gugi to respond, I wanna go back to a piece um, in the quantum sciences that takes on a lot of uh, awareness, but it's also for the literary, the humanist, as well as the historian, um, what is life? Uh, in 1944, Erwin Schrodinger wrote a small tract from a series of lectures, and his question was really about how fundamental physical principles, principles could define a boundary line between the animate and the inanimate. And Professor Gugi, in his book, has a profound chapter on orature versus literature, and the arbitrary or false binary that we set up between song, dance, orature, and written literature that defines maybe a boundary line between prehistory and history. What are the sources that we allow into our academic context to justify and support the bedrock of what is civilization, right? And so this question of what is life is not only a scientific question. It's not a question of merely when does an inanimate matter combine at what level to form animate um, beings with will and agency. It's much more than that. It's a question of when we speak or when we write, what is the relative aliveness or orderliness of the word? And where does the word take place in our speech, in our writing, in our work, in our loving, in our thinking? What are the ways in which animate and inab inanimate inhabit the page or don't? So um, 
as we end with the beginning, I'd like Professor Googie, if you will, to speak to us a little bit about truth and riddle and metaphor and how might these things answer the question of what is animate, what is inanimate, what is life? First of all, <clears throat> first of all, <clears throat> very impressed by, by all your reactions, you know, uh, by the, po the poetry <laughs> that has come from your responses. I was just totally amazed, you know, thank you very much. Uh, uh, like Ruha is clearly a poet. <laughs> Uh, so I really appreciate the key. Quite frankly, to me, the key, okay. Let me tell you a story. I moved to a new house in Orange, uh, New uh, California, and I've got a a backyard <laughs> that I love very much. You know, uh, when I sit outside, huh? uh, there's sunshine. Uh, I see so many things there. There are doves that always come out and land near my, huh? yeah, butterflies of different colors, you know, yellow, red, with some mixed colors, they're always moving, you know. Huh? I look at the lizards <laughs> on the ground, another bird, and the flowers, and so on. Huh? But of course, I do see other insects that I'm scared of, you know, like bees, for instance, you know, I, I don't want them to, uh, to, to get at me and others. And then I sit there and say, wait a minute. All these are connected. Yeah. Maybe this insect that I think is, looks, what I'm afraid of, is actually helping in breaking oxygen, in fertilization, doing so many things. <laughs> that contribute my being in a very, very, you know, uh, amazing. But there's another thing I always sort of think about. I say, I know I need oxygen. Well, everyone does, okay? Air, we breathe. But <laughs> so do plants. I need water, but so do animals need water, you know. Look, we are all again connected. <laughs> we depend on the same air. We depend on the same water, <laughs> you know. Um, so, so I just come back to the question of uh, connections, you know. And what's good about we human beings, at least I think, is we have one thing, imagination. There's a connection between imagination and dreams. You know, when you're dreaming, sometimes at night or wherever, <laughs> some things happen. Uh, you can connect so many things. Sometimes you might even wake up frightened or delighted or whatever because you had dreams. Eh? <laughs> yeah. Imagination in a way is like, uh, has the element of dream of connecting, eh? seeing possibilities, right? Yeah. So we have that one thing, you know, uh, uh, imagination. And so let us have economic systems, political systems, education systems, that help to free our imagination to be what we can be as human beings. Thank you, Professor Gugi. Um, Dag, Ruha, did you have some questions for Professor Gugi that you would like him to answer before we go to the audience? Okay. Um, but then, sorry. And, well, <laughs> oh. Uh, oh, let me tell a little bit about imagination. In 1978, yeah. I was 
uh, placed in a maximum security prison in Kenya mm -hmm. <laughs> for writing in my mother tongue, Ikoyo, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And by the way, the president who put me in prison was like a Koyo speaker himself, okay? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just like very clear. Yeah, uh, you know, but, and when I was there, you know, you're confined, you know, in a maximum security prison, there are walls and walls, there are guards everywhere, you know, right? And <laughs> what I, and they, they can't tell you a thing, even if it's raining outside, they won't tell you, huh? right? And there are walls and walls. And in my book, Wrestling with the Devil, I've described how I learned to escape from prison. Huh? <laughs> it's a wonderful experience, you know, to be able uh, to visit my village, huh? <laughs> to see my wife and children, to, uh, right? <laughs> to walk the streets of Limuru, I mean, whatever I wanted, right? And what was amazing, I would come back. <laughs> I would still be there. They, oh, they see me there. I'm nodding my head. <laughs> you don't know where I was <laughs> or who I was talking to. Right? Imagination, in other words. Yeah. Imagination allowed me to actually escape from prison every night or every day. Okay? You know, yeah. And it's being in prison that another imaginative activity helped me survive. I wrote my first novel, fiction, in my mother tongue, in prison on toilet paper. It's called, uh, it's called uh, um, uh, Devil on the Cross in English translation. You know. So for, for me, imagination, I'm talking, I'm, not, I'm just talking, imagination <laughs> made me survive. Mm. <clears throat> Uh, with my spirit intact <laughs> in a maximum security prison for what? Because I written a play in a koyo, my mother tongue. <laughs> and the president who put me was like a koyo. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? <laughs> so, speak. So, but imagine the key thing is really, really imagination. Yeah. So important for all of us. And many education systems won't kill our imagination. You see the war which is going on all over the world against the arts huh? and the humanities. Huh? And, oh, you don't want children to learn about the fact that there was racism here, the fact that there was <laughs> ratio, or whatever that's. Just try to fight against imagination, right? Yeah. So imagine some, anyway, imagination and therefore the arts you know and, and dreams you know uh, are really very important to our lives but you know what imagination does it connects right imagination like dreams they connect they are apparently unconnected <laughs> but you can see them yeah in prison i could fly <laughs> and i liked it <laughs> I tried to copy the, <laughs> I saw the bird flying across, you know, huh? Mm. Well, oh. in my imagination, I was actually faster than those birds. <laughs> I could go home and come back, <laughs> right? Yeah, so uh, imagination. And there's right now war going on against the arts as products of the imagination. And, but we remember, without imagination, who are we? Eh? Imagination makes us, right? But to confine yeah, that imagination, to, uh, to starve it. Eh? You want to kill the arts. You don't still to, to, to learn certain books on theory, you know, okay, or raise theory or whatever it is. You think that if you don't teach them race theory, they'll, they'll, they'll forget there was 
there was slavery and racism continues and racial inequality and other inequality continue, right? Yeah. But imagination allows us to connect. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, that I mean that it you see me shaking my head and taking notes. It just resonates uh, so much with um, what I've been preoccupied with and thinking about over you know a number of years in relation to technology and um, you know my sort of way of summing it up is that many people are forced to live inside someone else's imagination because a dominant imaginary is being encoded in our digital and our physical infrastructures. So that even if we're not physically in prison, we're, we, we are being shaped by a carceral imaginary that really infects so many of our institutions of education, of course, work um, is really evident in, in the conditions of work for many people, um, what we associate with health, um, you know, well-being, the list goes on. And so this um, reminder of the freeing potential of imagination, the corollary is also that imagination is often weaponized <laughs> and it's a site of struggle. Um, and precisely, it's not even directed only at the arts, but Im imagination is the starting ground, as you said, for someone before they build a, a building. So is the case before someone sits at a lab bench <laughs> going to Phillips work, before someone designs a, a syllabus, <laughs> they're, they're in, you know, encoding and imagination. All of our, all of our, our work begins with imagining, you know, from, this, from the question of who is this for? Who is this not for? What values is this uh, meant to, you know, advance? Um, what kind of world does this is this meant to create? And so I, I just love this invitation for us to take imagination seriously. It's not uh, a sort of an ephemeral afterthought, something that we can, it's not the icing on the cake. <laughs> it's, it's the wheat, it's the flour, it's, you know, the starting point of everything that we, we create. And so thank you for sharing that story of, um, um, being imprisoned and also being in your garden there in uh, <laughs> Orange. Yeah. Dag, I think you had something to say. Yeah, I just would like to thank both of you. And I, I'm just, I also have some kind of question, if possible, because, you know, um, there is this um, Buaventura dos Santos from Portugal. Yes, um, called it um, epistemicide. This, this, what is happening when it comes to, you know, erasing all these local languages, all these local and, and knowledges and knowledge systems. So, and, and he also um, terms it cognitive injustice. And I think there is um, reasoning relates to you. Um, Googie, and I just wonder, do you have any, how to say, suggestions on how to move on, how to, because it's such a massive, you know, work in order to do something about it. Yeah. I mean, you all have contributed. I mean, all, I mean, all, all we have to do is go, even at, at your responses, I mean, very, very wonderful, yeah. Uh, but what was I going to say? Oh, yes. Again, we come back to <laughs> uh, where we are. I know. I've, I've come to learn, or oh, not even come to learn, really, how much <laughs> we have to respect this human body, you know, my body, your body, you know, uh, right? You know, uh, I was talking to uh, Philip, before we started, about um, how I'm a, every I'm really amazed at how much uh, everybody we know in the world <laughs> is already contained in our individual human body, in our human bodies, right? I was say, saying 
I imagine the technology of motion, like cars, aeroplanes, but we already have it in our bodies, right? <laughs> because we walk. I would say technically, I can walk around the world. It will take me a long time, but you can. Technology helps us, technology motion helps us to go around that world faster. Huh? But that, we already have it in this human body, right? <laughs> then I sort of, technologies of uh, sight, again, <laughs> we already, have, our eyes can see, but of course technology helps us to see more huh? or whatever, you know, is an ex almost like an extension of what we ask. Our body is a, <laughs> contains all the technological system we have today, really, you know, uh, technologies of seeing, technologies of hearing, and now today technologies of memory, although they, but the one thing they cannot yet, <laughs> they don't have yet is the imagination, by the way. <laughs> that we still have, you know. Um, but I'm sorry to say, but all the other things we have, because you can see they are already ex extension of what we already have. And therefore, how precious every individual human body is, right? My body, your body, our body, and their body, right? Yeah. Anyway, uh, okay. So I'm just saying, again, from here, just remember, from here to there, <laughs> there to here, and that sums up really what I'd like to say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I I love the this idea of imagination that you bring in um, that the respondents have touched on because it it is the body but it is more than the body and this imagination that feeds life in us that when you were in a prison cell in the 70s that gave you life uh, beyond the closed system I think about I think about a lot of my work in terms of closed and open systems and science just like facts are not enough as Ruha said science is not enough right and the science in and of itself can be often a closed system. And you, you talk about metaphysical empire. I love that because if our metaphysics is closed and we think we cannot imagine beyond it, then we will produce science, we will produce mathematics, we will produce all sorts of objective, quote unquote, objective realities that are built around those closed systems. And how do we break out of it? Um, how, do we, how do we go? I wanted to highlight a quote that you made, um, uh, Professor Googie from Global Ethics, which I thought it struck me that you say, the colonial authorities feared orature more than they did literature. And I wanted to bring that out why you said that. Can you talk a little bit about why orature was so profoundly hostile to the colonial mindset? Or maybe that's not the word. Maybe it's why was, why was orature such a threat to yeah. the worldview that the colonial mindset had set up? Let me, let me try to respond fairly quickly, not maybe coherently, in terms of, say, America, since that's where we are. Uh, right now. Mm -hmm. African languages, as I said, were banned. Huh? There was a linguistic disconnection of the African from these languages. Whereas there was an, not a single linguistic disconnection of any of the European present with their uh, languages in Europe. Okay. So, and it's something which this specifically addressed to the read to the, <laughs> uh, to African American, American because I'm totally amazed by what they did. Let me try to describe what I, I kind of, I'm in awe, quite frankly, 
Let me try and try to explain this. Huh? Mm -hmm. Plantation. Language is banned. You can't talk in Yoruba or whatever. Okay. Mm -hmm. But I presume the English they are supposed to speak is not they are taken to school and they are groomed in the uh, uh, or whatever, anyway. So what do they do? Let me try to imagine. Mm -hmm. Of course, you cannot kill a language completely because the rhythms, you know, are still retained. Try and ban a song. <laughs> but then you can either harm it or even in your mind silently, it can play in your mind, right? Yeah. So I have seen that what happens is that uh, the rhythms of African speech, there's no way those could be <laughs> could be killed. I mean, there's no way. You cannot burn it. They're there. Huh? Around it, they put English sounds, so to speak. Huh? And you've got African-American speech. Now, let us see what that speech produced. Right. The spirituals, right? Oh, freedom. And before I be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave and be home there and be free. It's a spiritual that rejects the assumptions about slavery. Um, you see, I am not a slave, <laughs> right? Right? The spiritual. Part of the melodies of the spirit, even today, everywhere in the world, eh? they ring, they have certain appeal, it's an incredible thing about them. That's a product of the African speech, African American speech, right? Mm -hmm. let's, let's go, yeah. But that speech also produces blues, eh? <laughs> right? Again. It's more like, you know, incredible jazz, hip hop, but no something else. All those have become global systems, right? All of them. Mm -hmm. Now, tell me, and I keep on asking people, tell me what other language during that period, the same period that has produced these global systems in the area of culture, at least, right? <laughs> Don't you think, to me, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> that's very amazing. So I get, so African-American speech is not a lower rung on the ladder to an English heaven, right? It's very important, we should be proud of that add it to it you know i keep on saying this adding is always empowerment eh? <laughs> right when i'm in america i want to speak english or whatever language, any whatever language you know i mean i add to my language eh? so we add to not think is not quite you know and as you anyway that's orality you like you know, uh, mm -hmm. uh, I love that. Uh, uh, the spiritual was rooted in orality. Mm -hmm. The blues are more oral. Even if you look at the structure of jazz, <laughs> like, like improvisation in jazz, right? <laughs> Is orality, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyway, uh, yeah, orality is very. <laughs> But our is also what is close to our bodies. Our bodies don't begin by writing. <laughs> yeah. We begin by oh, making those sounds, huh? right? Mm -hmm. And then organize those sounds into speech, huh? right? Then we get the instrument, try to copy what already our one natural instrument can do or is able to do eh? by our mouths eh? well anyway, i think you where i'm going 
I'm still still <laughs> talking about the here, the importance of here, of my body, of our bodies, okay? And then connecting to whatever, you know, because imagination, remember, is a connecting system. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much, Professor Gugi. Um, we have a, a number of questions from the audience. I'm just going to try and curate some of them. So uh, Mikhail D. Max says, when Europeans talk about decolonizing academia, I often see references to African universities, knowledge systems, and methods that are Eurocentric, not really African. Just because we have great African professionals does not mean that the African knowledge systems has entered African universities. How can we start getting authentic African knowledge systems and methods acknowledged and respected? We, again, we have to start by ourselves. Let me tell you something, oh, not something. In Nairobi, in 1968, I was a new uh, sort of, they call them lecturers at the University of Nairobi, all right, okay? in the English department of the University of Nairobi, right? Yeah. Be able to join us. But I want to kind of start. I'm sorry, one second. We need to mute everyone. Okay, please uh, mute your microphone if you're not Professor Googie. Thank you. I'm going to give me one second, Professor Googie. Okay. There we go. Go ahead, Professor Googie. Huh? Go ahead. Go ahead. That's what we can. But I was just saying the average look in Nairobi, okay, the English department was organized as study of English national literature, which is by the is the same today all over the world. English literature means Shakespeare to T. S. Eliot or something like that. Okay. Uh, and we said, wait a minute, we're in Africa. Huh? Shouldn't we start with African literature? You know, was written by Africans. With what, even in Kenya, with what is written by, by Kenyans, what's written by East Africans, what's written by Africans, what's written by Caribbean Africans, what's written by African Americans, what's written by other related peoples of Asia and Latin, and then Europe. What's wrong with that picture? Mm. In Africa, make Africa the center. That was the beginning of this centric, Afrocentric, if you like. It was first stated in Nairobi in a statement which you called for the abolition of the English department. That was 1969. Okay? Very important. Because when you come to think again, colonization is also colon of the center. Say so your center is not a center of being. Your body is not the center of your being, you know. And we have got to rediscover re re what we can do, you know. I mean, not only what build on what we have done and then build on it, add other things, learn from other people, but based on rooted in our own, there's nothing we cannot do. Remember, ox exchange of oxygen, right? But it doesn't mean, but it must be exchanged, right? From whatever you are, right? So it's for us, let's say African people, African American people, Caribbean peoples, other peoples, to start where we and then see connections. I can't overemphasize the importance of connection. And remember, imagination always connects, even the impossible, right? You can, you would imagine, you can find somebody walking on 20 legs yeah? and looks for, you know, the imagination, create possibilities, you know. Yeah? So really, is we African black people, uh, formal colonized peoples and so on to say, to accept ourselves. 
our languages, our bodies, our clothing, then add. To, there's nothing wrong in learning from others, huh? right? We, I'm, just now every night I listen to aspects of Egyptian history right now. And I'm amazed, I ask myself, I'm 84 and it's now, it's now I'm learning about what these ancient Africans were able to do. Mathematics, writing system, architecture, the notion of the state, almost religion, you know, math, the fourth two laws of math, M-A-A-T, right? The judicial system, you can all find it there, right? So why, why not take that's our base and then connect to other systems? See what the difference is, what are the similarities, what, what, what is better than ours that we can borrow? There's nothing wrong in that. But when we reject our base, when we reject the here-ness of our being, yeah, that's when everything goes wrong. Okay. Because if you reject the here-ness of our being, then you know this from which to connect with anything else, right? But from here, remember, from here to there, there to here, in a, dial a dialectic process of mutual illumination, hmm? right? If I know the river around me, literally, then if I run up another river, I'll say, oh my God, is this, this how, oh, it looks like mine here, but huh? here it moves in this other way, it moves through mountains, and mine moves through place. You can begin to make comparisons between the one you already know and the one not yet known, okay? But the colonial process was said, no, you must do the other first, another one, which has nothing to do with you. Instead of the other, instead of the no more way. So it's we who discover our here-ness, but not become prisoners of here-ness. The here-ness is quite frankly base, but you don't get confined to your base. <laughs> Your base is there so you can move, right? Your base is there so you can connect to others mm -hmm. from a strong base. But our strong base is the one which was shaken, eh? colonized, if you like. We must our base, but not become prisoners of that base. Okay. We have our home, but if someone was telling you, no, you cannot leave your home. Or if you told yourself, I can't leave my home. Oh, no, 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 I can't leave my home. Then your home becomes a, a prison, mm. right? Mm. Your home is your home. It's a place you can leave and come back to, <laughs> right? From your home, you can go to cities all over the world. Huh? Yeah. But, and what you from from those other cities in the world, you can come back and say, mm, I can make me do my offense. I can add this to my friend or whatever, right? Yes. But you know where to come back to, right? Our base is what was uh, abnormalized <laughs> by the systems of oppression. But otherwise, from, I just can't say it better, from here to there, there to here, <laughs> right? Yeah. Global ethics, in other words. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you, Professor Gugi. We have another question that came from uh, Portia, writing from Rwanda. She said, in articulating, signing, thinking, speaking, or writing, decolonialize, might there be possible persistences unconsciously or consciously around illusions of colonial grandeur? What about revolutionary languages that are utilized to deconstruct them perceived illusions. Like how earlier you mentioned black power as a powerful language connotation. 
Um, do you have thoughts on that, Professor Gugi? I'm not quite sure whether I understand the question. Can you? Yeah, I'll read it again. Here, I'll. I, I, so, in articulating decolonial or decolonized, um, might what are the unconscious and conscious illusions? of colonial grandeur that we must struggle with? What yeah. about revolutionary languages that are utilized to deconstruct illusions of that grandeur? Can you speak to that? Can you speak to both the illusions that we struggle with in decolonizing, as well as revolutionary forms of language that can be used to deconstruct those illusions? Oh my God. <laughs> I. <laughs> No, first of all, I'm not quite sure that and that's the question, but let me just try to, to answer it in my own way. And okay, fine. That'll be fine. Wait. Mm -hmm. I come back to the here. Huh? Right. Mm -hmm. you know. One of the problems we might have, or can some of you have, is when they won't become the that which was oppressing them. You see, it's mm -hmm. like a child who has been abused becoming an abuser, right? <laughs> we have to be careful about that as well, you know. Huh? That don't think that our granda is uh, that him, uh, is you know oppressing <laughs> other people. Uh, that's why I fight in Africa. I'm fighting. I can't. Is a but. I don't know what I want to do about this vocabulary of the tribe. Why African people, educated people, will still group up as tribes, but call other people peoples? Huh? Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. We talk about English people or the English, the French people or the French. Yoruba people in Nigeria are, are 60 million, or well, at least 40 million. Mm -hmm. uh, oh dear me. Uh, 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 they are 40 million, at least. We call them a tribe. Danish people, they are only 4 million. We call them a nation. <laughs> right? What kind what is what the mentality this or is conditioned even me you know, oh I'm a lawyer, I'm a Yoruba by tribe huh? oh he belongs to a tribe right 60 40 million people Icelandic people are a quarter of a million and we talk about Icelandic peoples we talk about Chinese people, uh, Japanese people, or the Japanese. When it comes to Africa, I don't know why it must be <laughs> tribe, <laughs> right? Mm. You know, I'm talking about we must be careful not to become like Kenyans right now, some Kenyans who think they're doing a very wonderful thing when they run schools for Kenyan children uh, on this of British national curriculum, mm. right? They think they are doing very good. This is what the problem is. They think it's, oh, they are being very modern, eh? right? Doing Kenyans a lot of good. Kenyan, a Kenyan, a Kenyan who was colonized by the British settler colonialism now running curriculum based on British national. Not learning from the British, that's different. <laughs> like to read Dickens, Shakespeare, and all that, right? But I don't become a prisoner of Dickens. So what we have to be careful is we don't, okay, let me, let me sum it up. We don't in, in danger of uh, building societies or normalized uh, abnormality of the colonial system. And then we think it's normal, <clears throat> right? 
that's the danger I can see, you know, uh, happening to us. So that normalized abnormality can be in relation to how we think of other communities. Uh, we might think that oppression is okay as long as I'm, it's me doing it to another African or whatever, right? Or once we think it's all right for the West continue mining our gold, our diamonds, our copper, our cobalt in Congo, in South Africa, in Zambia, in Tanzania, in Nigeria, even today, right? And we think it's normal because I am sort of, I don't know, and it's really, ah, anyway. Uh, <laughs> anyway, let me just serve it up again. Hmm? Accents for access, no. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. Let's access our resources, okay? <laughs> Let's, we can, and then exchange, make things on the basis of equal give and take, right? Use diamond, that'd be the ones who are mining our diamond, making the, and then exchanging our product with other products from China <laughs> or, or France, right? But not this other up, not this other way where we now accepted that 90% of African resources are still consumed in the West. And we still talk of Africa as needing aid. And it's Africa which has been donating to the West for the last 600 years, mm -hmm. right? Africa made the West. Until we learn that, I don't know how, you know, huh? we made the West, we continue making the West. We give the West, we couldn't give to the West, although by force, obviously, I'm not saying that people willingly became enslaved and that kind of thing, mm -hmm. right? But that's the reality. Sli slave as a commodity, we know if all the kings and queens of Europe invested in slave ships or in slave corporations, all of them, right? And that's a reality. Then it comes plantation free labor for I don't know how many years. <laughs> And then comes the colony, free resources <laughs> of diamond, of copper, of uranium, yeah, yeah, right? To the, to the present day. Yeah, yeah anyway. Uh, I think it's a perfect segue, Professor Gugi, to just commenting, if you would, a little bit on the post in post-colonial and the neo in the post of post-colonial. There's a great quote, and I'll, I'll highlight it for people in the chat. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to put it in the chat so people can follow along. But this is directly from your book, uh, Global Ectics, but it's not cooperating with me. Give me one second. Um, yeah, here's the first part. It says the term post-colonial, however, is problematic despite its widespread use as description in theory. This is Professor Gugi writing. Is the colonial period that follows the colonial act also post-colonial? Can you then have post-colonial colonialism? This raises the specter of countless posts, or does it refer exclusively to the period after the rupture with Imperial Europe, the independence era, deemed the formal end of colonialism, the after the end of colonialism. It could apply to the whole planet in the sense of a pre-colonial, colonial, and post-colonial world, including the West, of course, as when we say BC and AD, before and after the Christian era. In this case, does it replace or absorb the terms modern and postmodern as a reference to the same historical periods? Or as Kay Anthony Appiah has asked, is the post in postmodernism the post in postcolonial? Could you comment on that for us and oh, expand yeah. it? I don't need you know, the whole book. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, to me, quite frankly, let me 
let me let me just use one thing which I and use as a measuring. Yeah? If I come to New York or Nairobi, let me take those two. I have a choice of looking at New York for the point of skyscrapers in New York, okay? Or from the standpoint of the people on whose bodies those skyscrapers stand, okay? In other words, I want to see how is a working man or woman in New York <laughs> living? Is it, do I see some uh, unhoused people in the city of New York with skyscrapers? Do I see some people going without access to health? You know, because that's how I should be able to measure the glory of New York, really. So in the same way in Nairobi, do I look at the new road systems, you know, or do I look also at the woman who is, does not have food to, food to eat that night, who cannot send her children to school, who can't pay for, uh, for medical treatment and so on, you know. So this is a challenge to not only not to have everywhere, even America, you know, we had to make, to, 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 to see whether, do we look at the reality from the standpoint huh, of those in, in policies <laughs> uh, or from the standpoint of those, uh, I don't know, on whose bodies the policies uh, stand, you know, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, that's, to me, that's the key. Do you look at the rest from some of those who are at the top of the mountain or those who are at the bottom of the mountain? Mm. That's what mm. tell us a lot. Mm. If, no matter where we go, whether you go to China, to India, Nairobi, New York, Washington, Paris, London, yeah? Use that as a mission stake. It's my measuring thing. Uh, are there people it seems so wealthy. Are there people who can't access medicine? Huh? Huh? Who can access school? Who don't have food to eat? Because mm. if it's an advanced civilization, these are the elements which we should actually have ended. Mm. Mm. That, that comment reminds me um, of this 1972 book by James Cone, God of the Oppressed, which fits so well with this idea of the perspective of truth always being perceived from the bottom, from the oppressed, from the standpoint of those who yeah. built the society or on whose backs a society was built. We have a question from uh, Akhil Kalfani who says, I want to combine the thinking of Professor Gugi and Professor Benjamin to look at imagination and spirituality. When we embrace and become centered in our African spirituality, there is maybe no separation of it from the imagination. And then he asks, did the Dogon actually travel to Sirius B or imagine it as accur accurately as they did before the Europeans saw it? So perhaps you can comment, Professor Gugi, if you, if you would like on the exact question, but maybe there is something you can say about what a God of the oppressed or a theology or a spirituality of the decolonial would look like. Oh, dear me. <laughs> okay, to me, sorry, I'll be very simple. Uh -huh. Sure, sure. See a world uh, in which every human being can have food to eat. Uh -huh. mm can have a house to live in, can access to health, okay? You know, can send their children to school, their students to hospital, uh, have shelter, and then have, well, in other, in other, the basics of what it is to be human, right? Yeah, that's what I want to see, yeah. I, uh, 
okay, let me give you another picture. I once went and my son Mokoma, who is doing a lot of my my son Mokoma, Mokoma Ango is now a professor at Cornell and he has been traveling to old slave sites in uh, and he was recently in Zanzibar for the Mabati Cornell Prize in Swahili. And then he traveled to Zanzibar and went to one of the slave markets there. And he tells me that he started, and he started weeping. Hmm? Recently, what about three weeks ago? Hmm. Yeah, he was telling me, huh? He wept. He wept. Uh, right. Anyway. Uh, no, no. Oh, yeah. So, <laughs> which reminded me also when I went to uh, slave, uh, to, 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 I think Ghana, I went to Cape Coast, Ghana, and I went to, uh, I think, yeah, there's, there's a, how the ship was built. I went to ask one of them, because there's a museum now. Huh? And on the, on the, uh, what do you call it? The, the, the top below the ship where, where slaves or the enslaved were, bodies, mourning, shitting on each other or whatever, you know, it's whatever. Uh, in the deck, oh yes, sorry, the deck. In the deck above where church, I saw it with my church <laughs> on top of the deck. Yeah. And I was told this is where the, the upper deck is where they would have ballrooms. <laughs> <coughs> they have ballrooms, okay? And they go to church. Huh? And this church is built literally below the deck. People are dying. Mm. Above the deck, people are saying, you know, amazing grace, how sweet mm. the sound that say, ah, rich, like me. The morning is downstairs. The, I don't know. Anyway, we want, what a, we don't know what a world which is built on dying bodies below the deck mm. Mm. and church going, dancing, ballroom, eh? tiny population at the top. Because that structure or that fellowship is our society today, whether in Africa or Europe, that's still the structure of policies at the top and prisons at the bottom. Mm. Yeah. What a powerful and, reminder. Uh, yeah. You don't squalor, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Grandeur built on squalor for the many. Mm. Grandeur for a few, squalor for the many. Mm. You, you want that kind of world? Can't you imagine, again, we got the imagination, imagine a different world. Eh? You know, and if, what we do with our common earth, the space we call the globe is limited, but it's all ours. <laughs> Can't we imagine a different future rather than one of palaces for a few and prisons for the many, really, yeah. Yeah, that, that will preach to us today. Um, we have one final question for you, uh, Professor Gugi, is, uh, comes from Ria Nunu. Um, is it really possible to use educational institutions as they have been constructed in order to decolonize our cognitive process? How or would we have to rethink how these institutions are structured and knowledge disseminated across generations. Yeah, with the, with the colonization, probably the colonizers, colonization at all levels, all the structures and so on, you know. So the colonizers, 
us even rethinking hmm, our classroom, right? Even architecture, some of our classroom might be as important to do that, hmm. right? Yeah, we have to rethink, to decolonize our institutions. And by the way, decolonization is not only for those formerly colonized. <laughs> okay, colonization is always the colonizer and colonized. There's no colonizer without the colonizer and colonized. Yeah, so in the same way, uh, the colonization has to involve the, colon the colonized and the colonizer. <laughs> That's why when they talk about reparations, I understand it, even seen a structural sense of reparations, right? Thank you so much, Professor Gugi. Um, I'm really reminded at the end of this conversation that it takes a village to do everything and it takes a village to decolonize. So thank you um, for your wisdom that we have been able to sit at your feet for the last two hours and just understand um, what it means as you being our, our teacher, our brother, our um, uh, compatriot. And so we're grateful to you and for your wisdom and for your life and the sacrifices you've made to bring the truth of decolonization to the world in all of our knowledge systems. Um, thank you, Dag. Thank you, Professor Benjamin. Thank you, Dean Williams. And thank you for all those who joined this conversation. Thank you so much for making this a part of your day. And as we think and imagine together what decolonization looks like, I hope you will continue coming back to the quantum biology lab, to the works of Professor Gugi Wathiango, um, and that we can together create and construct a world where uh, no one culture, no one country contains the truth, but we can all point to it. Yeah.